Hello. Hello. And this is Finish, Finish Big. Big. Yes, we have been listening our way through all Big Finish releases in more or less order. We're getting there, aren't we? Very, very slowly. We've got an entire bookshelf downstairs, um, sorry, a bookcase from floor to ceiling, and the we've only reached the second shelf on it, so we're getting there, we but are. slowly. We are. I'm Mark. And I am Joe. Uh, but this time we have a very special guest with us who has produced and written many Big Finish releases. So everyone, I just want you to think of your favourite Big Finish script, okay? Mm. The Sontarums. Yeah. Any more? Oh, hundreds. Home Truths? Well, I can guarantee that our guest wrote it. The Cold Equations. Yeah, from the Companion Chronicles, Early Adventures, Benice, Graceless, The Lost Stories, not to mention the many books and comics in the Hooniverse. I've never used that word before. Uh, it is, of course, our guest, Simon Guerrero. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> You have done so many different stories across many, many ranges. Uh, and we're going to talk about a, a few of those today. Can I um, ask a question before you even yeah, ask go, your go first question? It. Where did it all begin? I think it's the settling, but I could be wrong. Uh, so the first thing I wrote for Be Finished was a short story. Um, um, uh, a short story called The Switching for uh, their first volume of Short Trips in 2002. Uh, that's they've since done a, a an audio version of it, but it was originally published in a book, um, which some of your listeners may be able to remember uh, the days that, that there were books. Um, <laughs> and I got that because I've been pitching uh, ideas for Doctor Who books, novels to Virgin and BBC Books. And as a result of that, had um, had some conversations with Jacqueline Rayner, who was an editor there. And when she became the editor of the first Big Finish short story book. She, um, I think Jonathan Morris, who I also had got to know then, said I was just about to leave my job and go freelance and I would be needing work. So Jack let me pitch for it. Um, and it was, a, it was a, the theme of the book was Zodiac. So every story had to have a I theme. Remember it, yeah. And I thought I was a bit keen. So I thought I would pitch, I thought it'd be too keen to pitch an idea for every one of the 12 signs of the zodiac so i pitched six. Oh, um, okay <laughs> that was that was that was keen but not too mm -hmm. rich um plenty to choose from there yeah 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 and jack jack commissioned um jack commissioned the switching and it all went from there but um oh sorry no, no. I, well, you will get to your first question but you did write the time travelers as well didn't you for the bbc past doctor range yeah so that was in that was published in 2004 uh, 2005 because it was after I delivered the first draft the day before Dalek was on because it overlapped with the new series uh, but that was I pitched that to BBC in 2003 so I'd already written a big finish uh, I'd already written a story or two three short stories for big finish by that by that point um, but I've been pitching to um, Virgin and BBC and getting, you know, and kind of corresponding with them. They'd send that first, they'd send a blank rejection and then they'd send a rejection with a bit more detail and a bit more specific things. And I got to meet people and stuff by going to conventions and pubs and things. So, so, um, but I, it took me about 10 years to get, Gosh. you know, I, I pitched all sorts of things. Most of, most of those um, things I pitched, I've got sort of cannibalized for big finish plays since. Um, I suppose there's a lesson there in don't give up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just you know, and and you kind of learn, you kind of learn how to do it by through that process of being knocked back. How did you come into the the niece range? Was that through the the anthologies first? Yes. Or... So I had, I mean, I pitched for, I pitched a Benny novel to Virgin. Um, so I pitched a, I pitched a Doctor Who story with when Bernice was still the, the companion mm. in the Benny books. I pitched a Benny novel after she'd left the Doctor. So that was what, 98, 99. Um, and I got to know Paul Cornell at the Fitzroy Tavern and he's, and he'd been very encouraging. In fact, he'd introduced me to Jacqueline Rayner because I'd taken my latest rejection letter 
to show my little gang of mates. Um, there was a little, there was a little gang of us who were all kind of keen on writing. Eddie Robson was one of them, mm. uh, and I had a really nice rejection letter, which was a, it was a sort of form A4 sheet with a tick list of all the things you'd done wrong, and they just tick the ones that applied. But the person had started writing comments in pen at the bottom, run out of space, and had gone up round the side of the page and then over. So, it was, and it was just a really nice thing to receive because it showed that they had things to say. So I took that with me to the Fitzroy Tavern to show off to my peers. Um, and Paul saw it and recognised that it was Jack's handwriting and said, she's over there. Do you want to come and meet her? Oh, amazing. Um, which was amazing. Um, and that, re- you know, that really, A, a it kind of really helped me because I suddenly made the connection. What I hadn't, what what I'd never re- really thought about was that because I kept sending stuff in, people at BBC Books knew who I was. It it never occurred to me that the same people would be replying and they'd go, oh, it's that guy again. Um, yeah. And having a distinctive surname probably helped. But <laughs> I suddenly realised that, you know, Jack knew the three or four things I had sent and that each one was getting, and what she said to me was each one's getting, you're going in the right direction, each one's getting better. Um, so I, you know, I've kind of felt this has been a bit of a pipe dream and now it's suddenly, now now there's a possibility to this. Um, and in those kind of discussions, I talked to Paul about Benny and stuff, and he said, I'm doing an anthology, do you want to write a short story? So, and again, I pitched a whole bunch and he commissioned two of them. So, Which, um, which anthology was that, the very first one? So the first Benny I did was Life During Wartime. Oh, boy, that was great, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And what a thing to be part of. Mm. And, um, because it had gone down so well, Paul was thinking about the next one, which was a life worth living. And he was discussing that with a few people. And I pitched a few things and had some ideas about what might work. And again, being very keen, kind of pitched to him and pitched to him. And, you know, whenever I saw him, I'd go, oh, I've had this idea and I had this idea and whatever. And Paul, with infinite patience, rather than telling me to go away, listened and, you know, yes, I like that. No, I don't like that. This kind of thing. And then, um, bless him, he got Doctor Who and was writing Father's Day. And that was much more work than I think had been anticipated. So it just, you know, there were there were multiple, as he, as he talked about, there were multiple drafts and it, it just was a longer project. So he said to me, I'm not sure I've got time to devote to the next anthology. Would you like to take it over? Um, which was an extraordinary, uh, generous thing. And, you know, generally, that, that was the first book that had my name on the cover. Um, and so he set me up with a kind of interview with Gary Russell, whose main concern was that I had about six weeks to commission and deliver the book. Wow. During which I was getting married, which Gary knew. Oh. He knew because I was I'd invited him. So he said, How are you going to do it? And I was kind of like, Well, to be honest, most of the book is we know what it is, and Paul's talked to enough people. So if I commission it, go off and get married, and then it comes in after that, I can turn it around and deliver it and you know it all works and I've got a spread and I showed um I've been working in project management so I showed Gary my spreadsheet and it was my my skill with excel that um convinced him and then and then because of that I pitched another you know Gary was like well you seem to know what you're doing do you want to do another book so I was doing another book and then I pitched him a play and the lost museum I delivered early and we recorded it Literally, Gary just went, this is fine. We're a bit behind on Benny. There's some things. This one I can get into studio straight away because it's it's just easy to do. Yeah, we were in studio on the day I was meant to have delivered it. Um, and I got on with Lisa and Gary just kind of went, you know what you're doing. And I'm looking, I'm looking for somebody to come in and help out with Benny. Do you want to do that? Oh, so, I mean, that's a hell of a journey going from pitching rejections too then you're in charge yeah yeah and and i wasn't in charge to begin with i was originally just to kind of helping him get the continuity right the, the continuity got a bit tangled up and there mm-hmm. were there's one story where betty was with um was with jason and then there was one where she was with Har- uh, uh, harry myers's character and uh, all of this kind of stuff with just 
there are there are things that have been set up that haven't been delivered on and and you know what's all what are, what are we kind of delivering so i i originally started on that kind of going i think we should have a kind of plan of where this is building towards um and then that that off the back of that i became kind of script editor of benny and then gary was offered the job in cardiff working on doctor who and i turned up to the studio to record a benny play and um everyone was referring to me as the producer and I'm, oh, I'm, no, like, no, I'm really not gary said don't say that in front of gary because it will you know whatever and then gary turned up and went oh yeah have i not talked to you about this i thought you did <laughs> um so i was the last to know basically um we just assumed you were gonna say yes <laughs> but, because it was all it was all set up it was all in hand it was so i you know I, it was um yeah it was and, and it was great. It was great. It was. It was really. Um, uh, you know, there, there, a lot of people took a to a chance on me and encouraged me and whatever. It was a very, very uh, a supportive, uh, friendly time, um, and I'm very, very grateful because, because as as you say, over a very short period of time, I went from having done nothing to to running things. Um, and what what an experience! I worked with so many amazing people and on some really fun stuff. Yeah, we we love that series, and that what a time to come into it as well with all all that collection stuff, the Brexitel saga. So you came in sort of series seven to eight of, yeah, of Benice. So, then... so was that, as you say, was a lot of it already set up when you came in to produce? Did you have an idea of where you wanted it to go, or were there certain points that had already been worked out that you could? Or play there with them there were a few so there were a few things that needed to be done um like practical things like for one thing the, the series was behind and they had they had been that you know the, the the production schedule had got behind but basically because doctor who came back uh on tv the the number of people who had to check and okay what big finish were doing with doctor who increased because there was just more people who kind of had to okay everything some of them were new some of them were whatever there were issues so things took longer um and because you know in the, in the early days of big finish I, I think what would happen is they would say to steve cole and jack rayner at the bbc we want to do this and they what well, and then they go okay that's fine and that would be kind of it and then there was a the people at what was then bbc worldwide uh and the people at cardiff making the tv show and how do those work and how do those balance and stuff? so all of that kind of thing and working out what the rules were and what the what the changing guidelines were because there was no sort of written format for what doctor who could and couldn't do but you know you, you'll remember that um as i'm sure you know there was some debate when russell was making the first tv show that with christopher Eccleston about can we kill anybody on screen yeah you know, all of those kind of things were being debated and in the air and, and and what kind of language can be used and how violent can things get and all of those kind of things, which just meant that there was a lot more, you know, it was all very friendly. It was all very collegiate and, and, and supportive, but things just took longer and things got more, you know, things. So so the Doctor Who stuff was more involved and that meant Gary had less time to work on Benny and things had got behind. So, um so I was brought in, Gary had some ideas about what he wanted. He had a stack of scripts that he had commissioned that for one reason and another had issues. Um, one of them was very similar to something else that they'd commissioned. One of them had too many characters in it. One of them, I can't remember. I mean, it's all in the, the Benny inside story. Um, there were things that Gary wanted to do with particular characters. I think he had a had an idea of where Brax was going to go and what that was going to involve. Um, and then there were things like um, we had the licenses coming up for the use of Jason Kane and Brax because they'd agreed licenses with Dave Stone and Justin Richards, and that was coming to an end. So I kind of had to have a conversation with them and what are we going to do? And they were like, well, we'd like to continue. We'd like to whatever. So then you go and talk to the actors and and Miles was happy to 
carry on playing Brax, but Steve Fuel was kind of like, you know, I've done one a maybe I've done one a year for the last two or three years. I don't feel I'm really involved. So we had a conversation of like, well, maybe we bring you into it more and give you a good run. And then we bring that to an end. And that would be a, you know, that would be a more meaningful mm. kind of experience for you. So so those are the kinds of conversations. And then I did a I think I worked my way through listening to them all and kind of made notes on we should pick up on this and we should pick up on that. And I was, you know, I talked to Paul about um, Paul Cornell about uh, the sort of wider universe of Benny um, and about things like we'd never really done draconians and Benny. Maybe that would be a thing. So I kind of put a, I pitched to um, Gary that we seek out the rights to use the you know and we have to pay so could we pay to use the draconians but i'm going to use them in this way so that they set up something else to you know so that so that we get value for money as a as a production team and stuff so all of that kind of thing um and yeah and i kind of planned it out as a word document with um i was really inspired by the outline Russell had done for the first series of Doctor Who, which Doctor Who magazine had published. And I wrote a kind of my kind of version of that. Mm. Of here's a few lines on each of the stories up to and including the wake. Um mm. and then I kind of just delivered on that really. That period, because we're massive like mm. Bernese fans, just for the entire run. But that period is my favorite period because it really feels like like you've just said there, all the building blocks were in place. But suddenly it was all bearing fruit and and all the character relationships were paying off and all the stuff with Brax. And then, may I say, you broke his heart. I was going to say. his favourite character, Jason. Jason came. <laughs> <laughs> so when you killed him off, sorry, spoilers. It, yeah, it was very, very sad. Some of those ones, uh, when you brought in the Draconians, the Judas Gift and the Freedom of Information and all of that, that's some mm. of the best I think they ever delivered, some of that, some of those stories. Well, you know, I've, I work with some amazing, amazing writers on that who all chipped in their ideas. And because, because I could kind of present them with the document, they could all suggest stuff for each other's stories and what we were doing. And I had very fruitful conversations with Eddie and with Joe Lidster, um, and you know all, all of them really, and and the people doing the books and whatever were all chipping in and and whatever. Um, and we, we were we were basically conscious of how do we make this? How do we make anybody notice what we're doing? Um, so I was kind of conscious that Doctor Who, that Big Finish was going to have to be a much more family focused. Um, you know the, the the tone of the stories we were doing was going to have to be much more accessible so benny could go a bit more new adventures -y, um mm. was my idea that we could we could sort of our niche could be the more adult fans mm. um that we could kind of do the storytelling where where things cross over from books you know that we could assume that enough people were listening to the plays and reading the books and whatever so that we could pay those things off together um i don't think i don't think we got everything right um you know, I learned very quickly that putting swearing in just made it sound very yeah. adolescent. Um, and and I thought I was being big, you know, classic thing. I thought I was being very big and grown up and I just sounded like a precocious 13 year old. It's a tortured um, effect, isn't it? When you can do it and you do, you don't need to do it. Yeah, yeah. And and actually, actually, the, the most adult sort of things I think we did were things like killing the cat. Um, yeah. But, oh, that broke my heart. That did. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 but but because mm. it's real, because mm. it, because it kind of dealt with real emotions that people could relate to, it is a sort of, you know, that that sort of thing. I think worked much better. It's the unfortunate thing, isn't it? In drama, is that you get the best results when you do terrible things to the characters you love, because that's that's what has the biggest impact. Yeah. Um, but like I I just so happen to have here uh, Bernie Summerfield, The Inside Story, <laughs> which I must say to you is my Bible when we oh, do good, these. Good. And I absolutely love this book because it's full of wonderful gossip and stories and and detailed synopsis and everything I love in order to sort of deliver trivia when I do finish big episodes. Um, and the impression I got was after Doctor Who came along, 
Bernice was a bit of a side issue and a lot of it was being made on the fly for a good couple of years until you stepped in and then there was somebody that was giving it sort of a hundred percent focus and i think you can tell in the product i think you can tell in the stories during that period i think i think they um there was definitely the relaunch with series two which um gary and jack and justin i think spears is um and i i really like i really like the collection setup um it's it's a bit after that. It's sort of series three and four where things are, well, what they're trying to do is make the stories a bit more standalone, which I completely get so that people can kind of come in and they're, they're putting Doctor Who monsters in and that kind of stuff to bring an audience. My understanding is that that didn't really result in more sales, particularly. So that kind of investment didn't really um work for them and that kind of thing of being a bit um standalone meant that meant that things kind of it's not that they didn't matter but there was let there was less draw to kind of uh, less appeal to audience loyalty um and those were all things that they had identified that gary and justin and jason and nick had identified at big finish that was kind of my brief when i came in um, and Gary took me out and basically said, these are the things that we think are an issue that we would like you to help us come up with a strategy for. So, so yes, I was, you know, I was involved, but I wasn't, that, that, that wasn't my, um, you know, as much as I'd like to take credit, that, 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 that was, um, and they, they, if I hadn't been available, they would have got somebody else in, you know, it would have been Eddie Robson or uh, Nick Wallace would have uh, done all of that. I think you downplay what you've done there, but oh, yeah. very, um, very quickly, can I ask you about this? Yeah, because this is one of the most detailed books to do with Doctor Who and that I've ever read. And like the amount of interviews that you've got in here. I mean, how did you even go about writing this? Um, so Ian Farrington started it. Uh, that's the main thing. So I was brought on to help him because he'd already done quite a lot of the legwork and he'd gone through the big finish archives so there was you know there's basically a filing cabinet in the office and he'd gone through that and pulled out everything valuable so i kind of had a skeleton of certainly the early part of it um and then yeah i just got in touch with people um and what then happened was it kind of spiraled that as i started writing bits up and sending it to people to check it would remind them of other things Right. um so uh yeah uh but i basically went a bit mad doing it um i don't really i was looking at it earlier this summer um because it was 25 years since they recorded the first benny play and i was looking out something for for somebody who was writing something and i was looking through the book going i don't remember any of <laughs> well day. it's an invaluable resource to me oh, so thank you very much yeah. brilliant and anytime volume two I think I think I'm I'm you know generous enough to let somebody else do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um going on to uh, another series that you're very involved in, Graceless, yeah. which mm. I have to say is a chef's kiss of a audio series. It is oh, absolutely it. one of my favorites. The characters Amy Abbey. Zara came from the Key to Time trilogy, yeah. which you wrote the first one of. So did Graceless come out of, was that sort of planned already, or did that just come out of the Key to Time? No, so um, the the Key to Time came about because Peter Davison was cast in Camelot, the Monty Python stage show, and he was going to do a year. And that meant he wasn't going to be available to record any big finish for a year. So he... Uh, said to Jason Hay Gallery, this is what's happening. I've got a week in whenever it was, February, whatever year that was, 2008, 2009, um, when I can record stuff for you. So they needed to record as much with Peter as they could in a week. Um, and they 
basically Jason had this idea, we'll do a trilogy. And also Nick Briggs and Alan Barnes were kind of deep onto Doctor Who. And they were like, if we give that trilogy to somebody else, that gives them three months break in the schedule for them to sort of catch up and regalvanize and whatever. That was the that was the idea. So um I had just delivered the wake, my final Benny play, and I was on the bus to a freelance job in London, and Nigel Fairs got on the bus and was like, oh hello. Um what are you up to? What are you up to? I've just finished Benny. What are you doing next? I don't really know. And then he emailed me later that day going, do you want to come to a meeting to discuss something I'm working on? So I went out with him. I met David Richardson for the first time, who just joined Big Finish, and Jason, and they talked through this idea. Um, and Nigel basically had the mm. idea of this sort of yin and yang characters um, who were not called Abby and Zala then. They were called... I can't remember. Um, and we kind of talked through it and what he wanted to do. Um, and then the main issue was was um, it all had to be written really quickly because it needed to be into studio in like five weeks or something. So there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of slightly um, manic changes of brief and changes of whatever. At the same time, at that same meeting, David Richardson asked me if I would write a companion chronicle. And I, and he kind of said, we've now got a format that I quite like for them, which is that you've got two stories going at once, which is one is the companion with the doctor in a story we never saw on TV. But at the same time, we've got the companion where they are now years after they were with the doctor. So you can have the two playing off against each other. And he said that would work for pretty much all the companions. It just, you know, it wouldn't work for some of them like Jean Marsh because Sarah Kingdom died. And I just yeah. said, sort of, because I'm irritating. <laughs> Unless the story old Sarah told explains how she could tell the story. To which David went, yes, I'll have that, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so yes. Thank yeah, God so you I... said that. Those those G Marsh oh, ones are so good. Yeah. But, 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 you know, I hadn't really thought of it any further than that. So I, I then was... Um, writing both together and um the 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 big thing with the key to time was that jason took uh kira and laura with him to conventions to sell the plays and they are i mean they're a force of nature those two they're really fun and really engaging and by chatting to people and charming everybody they sold loads of cds so jason yeah. was like, we need to do more um and also he was looking at uh, broadening, I think, as a result of Big Finish losing the license to the Tomorrow people. Jason was kind of thinking, we need to have more stuff that we own as Big mm. Finish, as, is our own IP. And he was also thinking about stuff they could sell to what was BBC Radio 7 and is now Radio 4 Extra. So all of those kind of things. Um, and he, yeah, so he said to me at uh, uh, a convention in Florida that I was at, because um, my life used to be very glamorous. Um, these are the kind of things, you know, could we do something? Um, and he said, and we're, we, you know, again, we're looking at the more adult end of the market. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of like, well, yeah, we need to do something that's not like what I did with Benny. So not swearing, but more adult themes, a bit more moral complexity i thought um and uh and so we did it and we did it as a, a i thought they were going to be released as as one-off stories three one-off stories which is why i wrote a, a kind of recap thing mm. for each one which is a box they didn't need um and i wrote and i wrote them kind of on the idea that maybe people wouldn't have heard you know you might pick up the second one but not have heard the first one and stuff um and then they produced a box and that sold really well really well um a bit to all of our surprise and then um radio seven were like yes we want this and we want more so it was um yeah it was amazing and what a delight and also because i i was um 
you know, I was just writing the pitch while I was in Florida. And a couple of the um, guests at the convention were kind of like, oh, you know, what are you doing? So I was there in the bar on my laptop and whatnot. So I'm just doing a pitch for a big finish. Oh, was there a part for me in it? Well, there is now, you know. <laughs> and when I when I deliver the scripts, I don't I don't always have actors in mind when I'm writing stuff. But on Graceless, I did for quite a lot of the parts. And when I when Lisa Bauman, who's directing it, sort of said, "Who do you want in this?" I sent her a list of who I'd had in mind, and I think she got all of them. I think. And I hadn't, you know, I hadn't cast everybody, but I cast quite a few of the parts in my head. And I was like, oh, that's nice. You know, that you didn't have to do that, but that's nice. But when I turned up at the studio, they all knew. So they all knew I'd written parts specifically, specifically for them and given them jobs. Mm. So they were all really pleased to see me, which mm. was an amazing feeling. Um, that first recording, I, when Graceless came out and people said, oh, this is quite dark and whatever what i uh, love yeah. about it well it was yeah it was a uh the tone of it was a bit of a surprise that more adult tone yeah. that you were going for because it's not it's it's standalone series you don't really need the any of the doctor who connections to it it's not the worlds of doctor who or anything it is it's standalone i, I do yeah, like I that about that, that you can do all of that stuff uh because i'd i heard it at the time and joe you hadn't heard it uh, no, before. I, so I I got you to listen to the first series, and we listened to the fog in the dark in candle <laughs> candlelight. Oh, but that was that was brilliant, brilliant as yeah. well. But the, even the sort of the, some of the violence in that first episode mm. um, was, I think you were quite I shocked saying, at the tone. I kept saying they wouldn't do this now, you know, they wouldn't be allowed yeah, to do this now. <laughs> but it's its own thing, and you can go into it as its own sci-fi series. And I love that. It was it was kind of it was kind of going. I can break all the rules of Doctor Who. That, yeah. That's kind of where yeah. I'm thinking. And and everything from I can have these characters kill people. I can have them do things that I know are wrong. But also I can do but what I was trying to do with each one all the way to the end was to find an idea that I found troubling. And I didn't really know the solution to. And I could kind of, a bit like having a sore tooth, each story is kind of probing at something I find uncomfortable. Um, and I remember the first one, or the theme of that first series, was I'd had a, I knew somebody who was in a um, controlling relationship. And they split up with that person. And we all kind of, a bunch of us rallied around and then they went back to that person. And what do you do? You know, how how do you respect that relationship? How do you whatever? Um, and it had really, um, I, you know, I kind of picked over that. And it was a thing that a few of my friends had talked about at some length and whatever. And that first series of Graces was like, I'm going to try and use that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to end it in a place that I don't like. Because I think that will stick in people's heads. Was my kind of idea. Um, and so all sorts of things like that. And I went to, um, when I was in, uh, uh, I went to Las Vegas with Mark Wright uh, in advance of going to Gallifrey, a big convention in Los Angeles. And we had an amazing time in Las Vegas, just mucking about. But I was so struck by how, by how Las Vegas worked that I was kind of like, oh, I'm going to use that as well, because it made me really uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm just how kind of uh, everything is about taking money off you. Um, and you think they bought you, a, you know, it's very nice and they bought you a glass of wine while you're playing card, but it's basically to make you play longer. Mm. So they're taking... That's, that's the setting in that first one, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. same notion. And, mm. and I found, as I was trying to explain what it had been like to my wife, I was like, I thought I was enjoying myself. As I explained to you what it was like, I'm describing this weird dystopia. <laughs> so those those kind of things were all going into it. Um, and then I was trying to write, you know, Kira and Laura are amazing. Their Ooh. chemistry is mm. phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I imagine going to a pub like, with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a wonder any of us survived. They, they, uh, I, I have such, um, I, as I said, the, the first series came out and people were going, whoa, this is dark. And I was like, is it? I just remember the recording days being a laugh and how much fun it was. <laughs> and, but also part of the fun was 
because it's very, you know, because there's a lot of drama and a lot to get your teeth into, the actors were all kind of energized about that. So, um, yeah, and it just became a, it just became a thing. So, so uh, Radio Seven wanted more, and we were kind of like, "How much more do you want?" And they said, "Well, we'd, you know, we'd like another three to begin with." And I was like, "Well, if I finish that on a cliffhanger, is that a problem?" And they were like, yeah, oh, "All right, what we'll do is we'll take three. We're open to another three, but that second lot has to have a definitive ending." So I was like, "All right, so it's a it's a nine plays. Okay, I can do that." So you then start planning where that's going to go and whatever. Um, and then, you know, we were like, "Oh, we can still do more graceless." So we did another four. Mm -hmm. um, which you know, I think I'm not sure if Jason even offered them to four extra, but those weren't broadcast. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had fun doing those. So it's like, what do we no do next? And Jason was like, "Well, why don't we have them meet up with the doctor again?" I was like, mm -hmm. "Can we do that? Is that is that you know okay?" So we did that. Um, and uh, but all of it, all of it was just really good fun, really good fun. Yeah. Um, the the thing you said earlier about um, it being a little bit uncomfortable and sort of probing into moral complexities that Doctor Who doesn't really touch because most of the time it's trying to tell a bit of an adventure story. I really like that about this series. And there's a few times I can think of in the main range where I've gone like, oh, I don't know if I feel entirely comfortable. I'm kind of laughing at this. It's, it's very dark ideas, but in it's done so brilliantly. And and the, the sort of the debates that they have and the smart dialogue is it's a brilliant yeah. show. Absolutely, though cl the cliffhangers between the series as well. It's like, when's the next one going to come out? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And part of that is as much about me going. Really? I really want to do more of these, yeah. so I'll end it on a cliffhanger, and they'll have to yeah. commission more. There's, there's lots of Doctor Who that I like. That you know, I like. Oh, of course. That, that, that has kind of that kind of uncomfortable. The, all the stuff that sits in my head that that kind of lingers long afterwards is the stuff where it leaves me with a question. What was that about? You know, the midnight, for example. What, what the the sort of moral can I, the the, mm. the um, that thing that the haunting thing that ordinary people have done such a horrible thing in midnight really, really sort of sits with you long afterwards. Jubilee's um, the one that always comes to mind for me because there's so many sick moments in that that are yeah, very yeah. funny but extremely violent. And I'm like, should I be laughing at this? That man's just had his leg cut off so he can fit in a Dalek. Because he's a dwarf, and, you know, I but I do, yeah. It is nice to to go into those spaces, mm. and I think sometimes with the spin off ranges, it does it frees you up to do more challenging stuff as well. And this it's still happening now, it, in a way that you know, like Cardiff or whoever approves all of this might look at a Doctor Who story that's dealing with some of the stuff that Graceless does and go, yeah, no, you're not doing that. I like, think, you know. I think I think you probably I mean depending what it is I think I think you can I mean I was saying earlier that 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 swearing and that kind of stuff you just wouldn't get away with but actually I think you can put that kind of moral stuff into a Doctor Who the problem that I think that I think the limiting factor is that the Doctor is such a powerful figure that you know things are going to be okay and the Doctor will make a judgment on the morality um so that not having that there gives you a much more morally ambiguous space in which to tell your story so that you'll never get your you know the thing about graces is you're never guaranteed that everybody's going to be rescued mm -hmm. um they could all die and mm -hmm. that that i found kind of interesting to deal with um there was a few times as well where I was like, are these the protagonists or are these the antagonists? I can't quite tell from scene to scene, you know, but I like that as well, you know. And it must be great having Lisa Bauman directing yeah. all of those as well. Yeah, yeah, um, she's like, brilliant. Absolutely. But I love working with Lisa. Absolutely yeah. love it. And she's, um, you know, she's very uh, uh, honest about what she thinks and what she likes and what she doesn't like. She has um, views on on... Uh, uh, casting and she has some amazing views on casting and, and and ideas about what will work and stuff um and it's just a really really um satisfying creative relationship you know i've worked with other directors and they're, they're, they're great but it's a, it, what a pleasure to work with lisa mm -hmm. 
we we did an interview with Lisa a, a couple of weeks ago and um we were saying to her you know you've done all these companion chronicles you know do you have any favorites things like that and she's going god it was so long ago I can't remember one and I just mentioned Jean Marsh and she went anything by Simon Gurria you know? <laughs> oh, so it's reciprocated yeah yeah she you can tell that she's a you know classically trained actress because she always credits the writers um mm -hmm. so you know good good work she puts the credit where it belongs yeah. <laughs> and yeah and she directed all those companion chronicle trilogies mm -hmm. that you wrote which were absolutely the the top of that that range as well was, but if we, we talk about the the gene mark like having that idea of how to get her to yeah so, so in that framing device that is brilliant well to be honest i had no idea how i was going to do it and then i was kind of like well it's got to be a ghost story it's got to be a ghost story so i was like well what ghost stories do i like well i like the kind of mr james ghost story for christmas kind of mm. thing there was talk about she'd just done something with mark gatiss and there was talk about him being the other voice mm. So it was like, well, I've got to write something that he would want to do. So my original idea for the the second character was a part for Mark. Um, and then that kind of led me into a, well, it's it's a ghost story, but it's also got to be sci-fi because it's Doctor Who. How can I marry those two things? Um, and, it, and then, um, so I pitched, you know, I thought if it's a ghost story for Christmas, it's got to be a Christmas story. So I pitched a kind of, festive you know thing and um alan barnes very sensibly said yeah the trouble with doing a christmasy ghost story is you're automatically going to get compared to chimes of midnight, oh, midnight. Mm. yeah by rob shearman which is fantastic you're not mm. going you know and he said with the best will in the world that's not a competition you want to get that's not <laughs> So, um, so to change it up and make it a bit more sci-fi and not Christmassy, and and so you kind of go, well, what's the least Christmassy thing I can think of? Um, and I think I had to go to IKEA. So I was thinking about, you know, what if they turned up in IKEA? Because it's a really unsettling, weird place. It is. Once you're in, you never get out. You get lost, and and you're kind of drawn to things that you would never normally buy, and all of that kind of stuff. So, so that was um, that was where it came from. Um, and Jean was amazing, just mm -hmm. absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. And and again, so fun to work with and so um, just, you know, just really pleasurable and stuff. And then they were kind of like, do you want to do another one? And, and well, yeah, and all the, trilo the trilogies from that, they just came from, they weren't planned as a trilogy as such to begin no, with. No, or... uh, the, the Oliver Harper one was a bit oh, more yeah. so i pitched cold equations yeah. off my own bat i had that idea but i pitched it for season 18 and it was going to be romana mm. who's and I, what because you know season 18 is where i came in as a doctor who fan yeah. and i was like everybody does douglas adamsy tom baker and romana too i want to do the christopher bidmeady one um, and it was going to be about entropy. That was the, the thing. And the orbits were all going to be about entropy. Um, so I pitched it to which um, David Richardson said, we've just commissioned An Andrew Smith for his first big finish, which is going to be season 18. And I was like, drat. Damn it. <laughs> How fantastic, because I love Full Circle. And David said, so who else would it, who else would this idea work for? So literally, I went through them in order, you know, would it work with Susan? I suppose it would work with Susan, but you know, maybe. And then got to um, Pete's Purvis as Stephen and just went, we've never done him as a space pilot. That works mm. perfectly. And then David said, I've got this idea for a new companion for to join the Doctor and Stephen. Um, could, you, could they work into this story? So the original idea was we were going to have the cold equations with this new companion without explaining who he was or how he got there so you're oh, yeah. as a listener you're immediately going what the hell is this and who's he and what's he all about with the expectation that at some point we'd reveal he's not meant to be there or whatever mm -hmm. and then the next story would be his introduction story because he was that's kind of the idea and play with expectations a bit 
to which Gary Russell at Cardiff went, that's a bit complicated, isn't it? Why don't you introduce the story? And then the second one, oh, yeah, we could do it like that. So um, that's what we did. And David, David Richardson had, you know, he knew who Oliver was. I think he came up with a name, his background, his, the sort of journey that he'd go on. Um and and that was just the brief. So so I think with the perpetual bond, the only thing I came up with was the monster. But Tom Allen came in and owned that part, didn't he? Like, and I've only ever seen him, you know, delivering witty jibes on television since. He's a, but he does some serious bloody acting in those stories, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, he's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And I I was aware of him as a name from interviews with Matt Smith about being in the National Youth Theatre. Because when Matt Smith was in the National Youth Theatre and got spotted by Wendy Padbury and signed, who signed him up as as an agent, Tom Allen was the lead. Oh, and okay. Was supporting actor. So they, I think they might have both got signed up by Wendy Padbury. Um, but I was kind of like, oh, you know, I've, I see he's a stand up and stuff. And um, and then he came in and just and, and knocked it out of the park. And also he and Peter Purvis were really funny together because they were kind of there was a bit of back and forth banter and chat and stuff and just got on really well. I and, I think I I guessed I guessed the twist of his, of what his character was about. You know, like there's this implication that there's a dark secret that he's done something wrong, and that you know ultimately he's a gay man in the sixties. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the way Stephen then reacted to that and went, "Is that it?" Like, yeah, I yeah. love that scene so much. So I had I had a lot of um so I talked to David Richardson about this in some depth. I also talked to Joe Lidster a great deal about it. I watched Victim, which is the the film that it was kind of drawing an influence from, and I read a couple of books on uh the experience of gay men in the late 50s and 60s that really gave me a kind of steer on it but um yeah it was joe who really kind of um taught me so i wrote a sort of version of that scene and then joe kind of came at it and and went look you know you you need to understand what he's he's you know what what it's not just this is who i am it it kind of it's a kind of world changing thing for him but for stephen it isn't um yeah and actually what stephen needs to do is reassure him so because otherwise their relationship changes you know that all of those sorts of things so so um yeah there was quite a lot of i think that was one of the not hardest but it was one of the most um it was we were very careful about that um and and took a lot of time over it and a lot of back and forth and stuff um and i was well supported with um with the cold equations you're not afraid to put a bit of science into Doctor Who. And I'm the sort of person, I'm a massive Star Trek fan, but whenever they start talking technobabble, I'm just drift off, you know, waiting for the character bits to pop in again. But somehow, I don't know how you do it, but you inject a lot of science into your stories in a way where I understand what you're talking about. Big, complex ideas. Yeah. And it just works within the adventure as well. And there's a couple of the Zoe ones as well where there's some big, weighty sort of science ideas in there. Well, well, you know, you can, you've just got to find the drama in it. And um, if you watch, like, science documentaries and stuff, like, you know, James Burke, who who I'm a big, big fan of, but, you know, but also Brian Cox and whoever else is on telly, they will, an awful lot of what you're doing in a, in a documentary is effectively a PowerPoint presentation, you know. That, so how do you engage the audience? How do you get them to sort of to, to pay attention and one way is to kind of dazzle them with graphics and explosions and whatever but actually that just distracts them from what you're saying what if you've got to find a way is to make the sort of visual element of it part of the storytelling and if you can do that you've really got them and you really arrest them so so you know the famous thing of James Burke talking about the way that um a vacuum you know you can store gases in a vacuum and then control them so that they come out in a controlled way and as a result of doing that you can do any points and off in the distance a space rocket takes off and he's timed perfectly 
that's amazing because he's got you into the story of it um but that's the same as as any element of drama you know if you're doing a fight sequence you want it to tell a story and have beats and have it you know that that it goes somewhere because if it doesn't for all it might look optically amazing it doesn't really add anything to the story or change where you are or affect your thing so so always you've got to be thinking about the emotional stuff and what i realized with the cold equations was that the complexity of it was the big monster and the more i kind of could sell you on the idea of this is hard the more you know the odds are against the doctor and stephen and that 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 creates the drama of it that kind of insight into character and stuff is is where is where and and it was my kind of pitch to david and jack who were a bit nervous about this was you don't need to understand the science to get this is a big deal um and you know and and that that's why it works um and once you know it works you can kind of go well what else can i do what other what other bits of science and stuff that i'm interested or find weird can i throw into this it just allowed peter purvis as well the chance to just for Stephen to be written so intelligently as well in a way that we didn't really see but probably should have seen and also you know i'd grown up on him explaining things so mm. blue of course yeah. <laughs> no, he i can remember him explaining how a two-stroke cylinder worked on a motorbike or whatever <laughs> oh, okay um and i gotta say as well I, I will move on from the cold equation is that bit at the end of episode one where that debris field hits i've yeah. never had a more immersive i was like this i was like, sort of going down like this you know and, and then um and then gravity came out and i did see tom and peter at something maybe one of the recordings of one of the later ones and we were kind of like they've made a movie of the cold equation <laughs> uh, george clooney is playing St uh, peter purvis and um and tom allen is is you know d d d well, anyway you can make your own punchline where's but, the royalties eh? <laughs> yeah yeah well but um but yeah all of that all, and what what gravity does is it grounds it tries to ground the emotion in a character having a life story back on earth and uh you know a, 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 it's all about her daughter and whatever and you kind of go I, I i find that like no actually what's going on in space is dramatic and impactful mm -hmm. enough um and you're kind of you're cut you're kind of creating a a drama that distracts from what actually is at stake um is my my kind of feeling you know, obviously, gravity was much more expensive, much more successful than my Doctor Who play. But having gone through a similar kind of thought process, that that was what struck me watching the film. About a hundredth as gripping, though, mm. gravity was. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> it must be great going back to those '60s stories, those '60s characters, and having the chance to flesh out more in there. Like in the, you know, with the Sarah Kingdom trilogy, go back to the Daleks' master plan and add double the episode count of that story and the yeah. uh the older Stephen trilogy i don't, i feel like there's something extra special about those first doctor companion I think, chronicles i think you might have solved the question of whether sarah kingdom is a companion oh she's legit you know, definitely after all, all that. those extra adventures 100 percent. yeah jean told me at one of the recordings that she wasn't a companion um and she said because i was told that by uh john wiles when we were recording the dialogue master plan because if I was a companion, I would have got paid more. Um, oh, oh, wow. Yeah. And I was like, well, now you are, because I've yeah. made it. Um, Absolutely, she is. It's yeah. called the Companion Chronicles. That means you're a companion. So <laughs> yeah. Is uh, there a, um, do you have a preference? Because you did the first person Companion Chronicles, and then you did the early adventures as yeah. well, which is more of a sort of full cast, or it's like a mixture of the two, isn't it? Yeah. Would you have a preference? No, it doesn't really make a difference to me. I think I think by the time I got to the end of the Companion Chronicles, I was, you know, I'd kind of I'd done a lot of these mm. and it was it was fun to do something a bit different. Mm. Um but in terms of the storytelling, what that they the Companion Chronicles allow you to get into people's heads a lot. But I think but I think I kind of exhausted that trick by the end of them. I was certainly very conscious when I did the last Stephen trilogy uh the war to end all wars and the two that followed that that i i was kind of like 
I've already done a trilogy about Stephen. What else have I got to say yeah. about him? Um, so I had to kind of find ways to open that out a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of in terms of the storytelling, you kind of shape the story to suit the format, really. Um, All I know was towards the end of those companion because I think it was a consistently brilliant run. Yeah, it's it's probably one of the best Doctor Who runs Big Finish has done. And I, but... I was listening to other people's ones, going, oh, you know, I've got to up my game. You know, listen to them <laughs> going solitaire, find and replace. Yeah, 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 yeah you can you can pull tons out of a hat. Yeah, yeah, and Jack's. Um, uh, uh, the suffering really made me go. Oh, we could have fun with these. They don't all have to be angsty and you know mm. sorrowful and and whatever. Which is where I've been kind of going to mind the drama. Um, and she and she just had a lightness of touch about it, which was like, oh, I really want to get in on that. So yeah, it was it was a really nice thing to be part of. Mm. It definitely rounded off all of those sixties characters really well yeah. so it's the only other thing that could have been done there should have been katarina trilogy that would have been <laughs> added even more into the daleks master plan <laughs> yeah, yeah somehow would, yeah, that would have been good i did um i did pitch dodo oh um, no you should... oh that should have happened yeah yeah i think they might have sought jackie lane out mm. um, but i don't know i don't know I, we did ask jackie lane to be on the because i made the making of on the dvd of the arc mm. we did ask jackie lane to be part of that and she said yes and then changed her mind and you know back, a bit back and forth so that was that was a shame but I'd, I'd, i would have loved to have worked with her i don't get much choice in who i write for it tends to be the thing that i'm given and then it's how can i what can i bring to that that's new or present something as uh, some kind of new perspective all I can tell you is, that, uh, you know, when I looked ahead at the schedules and I saw your name coming up next month, I oh, it's going to be a goodie, <laughs> whatever it's going to uh, Actually, I've got a question about that, though. Like, do you, because obviously those were very well received, the Sarah Kingdom ones, the Oliver Harper ones, the Stephen ones. So how much of that do you see? Or do, you know, do, like, are you told these these are very popular or? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh... I mean, people tell you, you know, like fans and stuff will go in touch. I don't, I don't really know. Um, I've certainly got a sense of which of the things I've written have gone down well and which haven't. Uh, I, you know, somebody sent me a really nice thing, I think, earlier this year about the Benny play, The Summer of Love. And I was like, I've met the other fan of The Summer of Love. You know, there's two. And uh, that's that's fine. But but. Uh, I like it, and and uh, we uh, um, at the end of the uh, Lisa Bauman interview, we did ask her. We basically did a little quiz just to see if she'd been paying attention about all the details of the play she'd been in over the last twenty years. And the first question was, "Did Bernice ever snog De Bev Tarrant?" And I thought she's never going to remember this, and she just went straight away, "Yeah." Under false pretenses, it was Simon Gurria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Guilty as charged, I'm afraid. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you do you do learn those things. You learn also, th but sort of attitudes change to things as well. Um, and also, and also, it's not like I'm not aware of what's worked. And you know, sometimes people will say, "Oh, that you know, I didn't really like that." And I'm kind of like, "Yeah, I know. I, I just messed it up, or, or uh, the structure didn't quite work, or I had something in my head that didn't I didn't quite get onto the page. You know what I had what what I had in my head hasn't quite translated in this. You know, and, but but you find that with you know Russell and Steve Moffat and Chris Chibnall were kind of like you know that they're, they're, they're writing they're they're aware of of uh, stuff. So it's not it's not always a surprise. But but with um with that kind of thing, it's it's what I find is more what people see in it that I hadn't anticipated. Um, and then the other thing is that I can listen to, you know, I can listen to Home Truths and go, oh, I know exactly where I was in my life when I wrote this. Right. Because without being explicit, it's all about things that were bothering me at the time. Mm. Um, there's, you know, and, and, and Graceless, definitely. Um, the, the, you know, Graceless 4, I listened to, I listened to some of it and was kind of like, oh, this is this is informed by the death of my daughter, my oldest daughter. Oh. Um, and without really being 
I think maybe I was aware of it, but I had things I wanted to say um, or th things I wanted to get off my chest and stuff. And then other things like, like you know, this is this reminds me of who I was seeing in the pub at the time, you know, when I used to go out and had a social life a long time ago. And as I was saying earlier, you know, listening to uh, Perpetual Bonds, that that and, and Cold Equations, that was when I used to see Joe Lister all the time and we'd chat about everything under the sun. So it's it's full of that kind of connection and that kind of joy of friendship and, and all of that, which and working with Lisa and all of those things. So they're, 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 they're um, the making of them and the, what was going on behind the scenes is as much tied into what I think of them as stories or, or how effective my writing was or not. Almost like a like a dear diary in audio format, isn't it? Like a a peek into that part of your life. Yeah, yeah, uh, but it also makes me aware. So, like when we interviewed Caroline Ford for um, the Looking for David documentary on on the season two thing, it made me suddenly aware that when you ask her, "Oh, what's your favourite story?" or "What was it like?" You know, what was it like working on the edge of, edge of destruction? She's not thinking of the edge of destruction as we do, as this you know these two episodes that add to the mythos of the workings of the TARDIS she's thinking that was when I was young and I was working with these people who are dead now and it's a completely different emotional yeah. space, you know her, where she comes from and what what she associates with her is completely different so so that I you know I'm much more basic because I'm getting old I'm much more conscious of those sorts of things I don't you've ever been to a convention but uh, these actors and directors and writers can be asked incredibly uncomfortable questions at times you know <laughs> yeah but i think i think as a fan you're just seeing the work aren't you and you're not seeing all those outside factors yeah I mean, to a certain extent but also people just don't remember um mm. and i find that i i you know i've because you said what you wanted to ask me about i have looked up some of the details because i can't remember what i did i did a, a bunch of big finishes in quick succession and i can't really remember the details unless i check the emails and oh yeah that's what the harm was about and and that's where you know you you mentioned the the ones i did with zoe uh uh which were fairly quick writes because uh something else had fallen through um so you know can you meet the schedule you know and whatever um i was like i don't remember until i was looking at the emails going, oh yeah i did do that but put them on they're amazing Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know you wrote them, but they're a good <laughs> listen, <all> right? <laughs> but also, what I find is that you know, when you when you you're a bit old like me, and you go to conventions, you see people that you know from conventions for years. So your relationships with the fans and stuff change it, and I and I'm kind of aware of that as well. That all of these things are linked. That that are kind of we don't watch and listen to Doctor Who stuff in a in a vacuum. It's it's all about these connections and things. Yeah, so you know, when when you ask somebody about working on something or, or working whatever, I mean, my first thought with Graceless, as I said, is not that it's quite heavy in places. It's just what a laugh it was to do. What how, how much fun, how creatively satisfying it was, um, and what a laugh we had, um, and just come out of the studio buzzing. Makes me want to get involved in it now. Do you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny because we're going back listening. We'll say our mission is to listen through all the big finish in order and going back to those early ones we're having memory you know you remember where you listen to a certain story yeah. i do all the all the time yeah. i know where i was when i was listening to home truths and the i think i got the second graces for a christmas present you know i just it goes back to those times we're having those memories going back listening to them as well yeah we we uh, um came out of the recording of the lost museum and um turned our phones on because you have to have your phones off in the studio or you did then um, and discovered that Christopher Eccleston had quit playing Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. So I, so I know exactly where I was because we were all stood there going, well, that can't be right. My entire life has been punctuated. Like I, can, I can tell exactly what happened in my entire life by various events that happened in, and stories that came out from Doctor Who. Yeah. It's, it's not been a waste of a life, I'll tell you. <laughs> 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 but, um, okay, so to, to sort of um, round things, I, are you still fucking with Big Finish now? Yes. Yes, is there anything nice. you can tell us about? Uh, <laughs> you at least had the same so reaction. I produced two Tom Baker Lost stories earlier this year. Great. Um, yeah, they basically said, do you want to produce two things with Tom Baker? And I was like, yes, I do. Nice. I want that on my CV. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Um, and he was amazing because I had not expected. So he, you'd send the scripts to him a week in advance and then you record for, I think we had about two hours uh, on a, well, you know, two hours a, a week with him. But he would have gone through the scripts and he had notes and he has ideas. Um, so I found myself discussing with Tom what the doctor's motivation is and how the doctor should react to things. Like, I'm going to tell Tom Baker how to play Doctor. <laughs> um, but really, really interesting. Really interesting. Can um, I ask, were some of those ideas madly eccentric? No, they were all brilliant. Oh, great. Um, he had very firm views that the Doctor should not be mean to Sarah and Harry, that, that he should be supportive of them and that he should make their lives better and he should respect them. He didn't want to do long speeches because he thought the Doctor shouldn't pontificate. He thought that was a bit too John Pertwee. Um, and he, the thing that he really latched onto with when we did the arc, the original version of the arc in space, was that the character as written in those scripts was not the character he had portrayed on television, that he was playing a different Doctor. And he was very keen, as you can hear, to really push that and go mad with it. And we were kind of like, do you know, it hadn't occurred to me that you're not, you're a different fourth doctor, you're a different person. And he said, he's older, he's clearly older, he's much more a sort of teacher character and he's much chattier and happier. He's much more the doctor that you see in Robot, but mm. played by an older actor. Um, and Tom just wanted to go with that. and. To be honest, me and um, Sam, the director, were kind of, we, you know, we chatted about this and just went, I think we should just let him go with it because the whole point of these lost stories is they should be different and, and they show you a, a, an alternative and stuff. Um, but yeah, he, he, so that was, that was fascinating. I have produced something that probably won't be out for a while. It's recorded, but there's a, you know, the schedule something to a, a, a scheduled way in advance uh, i've written a few things that are i don't know when they're coming out to be honest um i think they've been recorded i'm not really sure i know you can't i know you can't say too much because you know as yeah. of all it is all very yeah, yeah. so i've got i've got things but i i'm i'm um i mean i used to because I, I, when i used to live in london i'd go to the studios and i'd go to whatever but I, i've moved out of london so i'm a bit more remote from everything um, so yeah, when they ask me, um, I do stuff. I just um, wanted to know if I was going to continue to be excited to see your name in the schedule. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I'm pleased then, to see I am. Yeah, yeah, and then I'm doing lots of other Doctor Who things. So I work for Doctor Who magazine and the books and everything else. So, so yeah, I'm being kept very busy. But I think we'd be finished. I've, you know, I'm quite happy. I've, I'm very happy with what I've done, and I'm happy to ca continue working with them. But I kind of think other people. You know, I'm I'm very happy for other people to kind of come in and do. Uh, I think I've had my shot, so anything else is a bonus. But um, I I try not to pitch to them, um, so that other people can have their their time. That's kind of my feeling. And I know that you are working on something else that's very exciting at the moment. Yes. What's that? It, it, it's a book. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I've got I've, uh, well I've, so this year I've um, I made the mistake of working on five books at once, which oh, oh gosh was a bit nuts. Um, and although I kind of went from one to the next to the next, what would happen is that there would then be proofs or editorial things or whatever. So it was a bit of overlapping. Um, but yes, I've got a couple of things out from BBC Books. Uh, 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 so I co-wrote the Daily Doctor with Peter Angelides. And I worked on Johnny Morris's Hootopia, uh, which is out in November, uh, and me and Una McCormack were the uh, assistants. So I think that makes me Harry Sullivan to Una. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've written a, a Black Archive book on the edge of destruction. Oh, wow. Which uh, I am very pleased with. Um, it is basically my mad theories about what that story is about. And also my mad theories about how the TARDIS was originally conceived. Look, if it's anywhere near us as detailed as this, 
uh, we're yeah, in for a good read. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty hardcore, um, not least because it was inspired by my trip to CERN and the Large Hadron Collider last oh, year. Wow. Um, where they basically said, you know, that the, the studying subatomic particles and studying black holes, you can't look at these things directly. So what you have to do is kind of work out the fuzzy edges around them. And then once you've kind of worked out what the edges of them are, you can then sort of deduce what's inside. And I just had an email from Toby Hader going, we don't have a production file for the edge of destruction. How do you do a making of, you know, have you got anything from your research into David Whittaker? And I was like, no, but I've got some stuff that gives me a sense of the boundaries. And if we can work out what those are, then I think we can start making some. Uh, so, yeah, so it's 10 absurd theories about the edge of destruction, including what I think the Randalls in the TARDIS are. Because I think we can deduce that. That's a great range, isn't it? The Black Archive. Yeah, they're great. Stuff, they're... And really fun to work on. Um, and then the other thing is um, my 180,000 word uh, biography of David Whittaker, which is everything you could possibly want to know about him um, and is full of extraordinary. He, had, he lived an extraordinary life and was witness to an extraordinary change in television and popular culture and things and doctor who was just part of that um and i think you can see uh how his background in variety and light entertainment made him the perfect person for doctor who because he really understood what you could get into the limited studio facilities at the bbc and how far you could push that while keeping the drama and keeping the audience and things and he really understood how to keep an audience hooked to a series coming back by by the structure of it so that they know what they're going to get um and even you know the, even the change from nothing at the end of the lane to unearthly child mm. is part of that philosophy that he had applied to light entertainment mark and i we come at these sort of biographies from different angles because I'm, I'm that person that gets frustrated and goes, well, when are we going to get to the Doctor Who bit? Come on, I want to... <laughs> and he loves all of the sort of the stuff around it because he's heard a lot of the Doctor Who mm. stuff before. So sort of how's, how's the book structured in that way? Yeah, I hope it caters for you both. Um, so even when I'm talking about his early life and his childhood, I'm kind of going, and this is what he drew in, you know, there's so I know in the evil of the Daleks, for example, the middle section of the evil of the Daleks is set in a house a few miles from Canterbury. I know why that is because there was a house a few miles from Canterbury that figured in the life of David Whitaker's mother. So hey. when I talk about her early life, I can say, and David drew on this. In the with the Daleks. Um, so yes, so there's a bit of that. But I actually think even when it's not a direct thing, talking about him writing the continuity scripts for song and dance shows, he then refers to that later in a memo about the studio facilities at Lime Grove for Doctor Who, and specifically says, because I've worked on these shows, I know what the cameras can do. I know what the the, li the limits of the special effects are um and mm -hmm. so so even where it's not directly it all feeds into things mm -hmm. and then all sorts of odd things like um when he was working in australia in the 70s one of his drama programs in australia has a character called ramon salamander in it <laughs> <laughs> yeah so he was tying these things together so so even you know all of those kind of things are are um, part of it but but I hope it will open out who he was and what he brought and 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 but also how Doctor Who was part of a um a much broader shift in popular culture and television as an art form um and all of those things which will which I hope will kind of add a bit like when I write a big finish and I'm trying to come up with something new about Stephen Taylor I hope the um the book will kind of add to what you see in those episodes and what's going on. If if the documentary on the Blu-ray set 
taught me anything. It was uh, I just didn't know anything about David Whitaker and his story, how much work he'd done. I wasn't aware it's all outside of Doctor Who. And then I don't know if you read the JNT biography that Richard Marsden put together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the same sort of sense that the, his like David Whitaker's career rose and then sort of peaks and then in that last part of his life it's really it's very sad that the work yeah. wasn't there and there's a reason why the work wasn't there but it's almost like there's a dramatic structure to a book there isn't there no biography about somebody who's died is going to have a happy ending yeah. indeed that's, uh, that's kind of a that, that is you know that's how it works um and so Chris Chapman making the documentary took the decision to tell the story out of chronological order, um, which is brilliant. I have found stuff, I think it is a sad story, but I found stuff that I think my book has a happy ending because of things that we can address, but you know, without spoiling it. But I think um, there's definitely a positive to it all. Yeah, I, I, and I find I find him fascinating. You know, the, more, the the thing is that the more I found out about him, the more fascinating I found him, um, and and I hope other people do too. Well, uh, when's that coming out? Is there a release date for so it? It'll be out in October. So I've delivered it, um, and I've seen the cover, which is amazing. Um, and yeah, and it's being worked on at the moment. So so the the publishers wanted to have the manuscript and to okay it before they did pre-orders uh, very sensibly um in case i just didn't you know produce it uh so so yes it will be it, there'll be further details imminently well i think that yeah thank you very much for chatting to us today well, well no my, yeah. my pleasure it's really uh yeah. it's really nice it's um you know most of my time i'm just kind of sat typing not talking to anyone <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's quite nice to have a conversation I mean, the the joy of uh, where we're at with Big Finish at the moment in the podcast is uh, we haven't reached the settling yet. We haven't reached your Bernie Summerfield seasons yet, and we haven't reached your Companion Chronicles yet. So we know we've got a lot of gold to come. You know, so just from us, thank you for the work because it's been a, a, a ton of storytelling that we've absolutely loved. Oh, well, that's very kind. I mean, it's it's such fun to do. That's the thing. Yeah. You know, it's not like working. <laughs> what about what if Sarah Kingdom was a house? That'd be fun. <laughs> I want that job. Do you know? <laughs> but no, thank you very much thank for you. your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh my no, it's been my pleasure, really. And uh, and I'm so glad you're supporting it and getting people to listen to stuff again because it's there's so much good stuff out there. Mm. Um, and uh, and it's really it's really fun to sort of go back and. Dig, dig dig into it. There's there's so much um so much treasure there.